I just feel really fortunate that actually some of the people and the pastoralists and the practitioners I have learnt from are in this room today. Um, so there is a wealth of knowledge here. I am merely a conduit from the, all the stuff I've learnt from other people. <coughs> one of the things I, I, I think one of the things that I've really picked up in all my years of, of listening to these amazing people and seeing the work they've done is that you've got to use your brain. You've got to think about what you are seeing and you've got to work it out. You've got to work out that process. It's not a matter of remembering the recipe that made it work. It's like, you know, get all that information and, and, and use your brain to work out what's happening in your landscape. Um, so today I was just going to talk a little bit about some of the um, landscape features and processes in Central Australia that make, um, that we can look after and maintain our land condition, we can use it for restoring land condition and for increasing productivity. So I wanted to start with, you know, the fact that this is good pastoral country. In July 1859, John McDowell Stewart spoke of the country between the, you know, around the SANT border as wonderful country. And we certainly know that once the Overland Telegraph line came up, you know, there were stations up here really quick smart. And, you know, if you look in some of the old um, uh, diaries and papers that were written, pastoralists described a lot of this country as really good fattening country. And I wanted to put that in there because I think that sometimes we, we only know what we see um, and, and not all of us get the experience to go to lots of different places. And, and sometimes, you know, we might not be seeing what it can do at its best. So, you know, use your brain and think about what's out there. I'm just going to flick through. Okay, so the first thing I was going to talk about are some of the landscape features that drive productivity. Um, I was really fortunate to work a few, oh, 20 years ago with a man called Russell Grant who was a geomorphologist in this region who, you know, had a pretty good idea of how some of the details that we miss work in this country. So the first thing that I wanted to make a comment of, and look, I think we all know this, we all say it, but to really think about it, that our soils are really highly weathered, well sorted and nutrient poor. Um, <coughs> arid Australia is very old in, in compared to a lot of arid regions around the world. And it, that means it's been exposed to a lot of weathering, both wind and uh, water for a really long time. And this has moved soils across the landscape in such a way that it has resulted in a really high degree of differentiation. And when you look at our landscape in Central Australia, there's a lot more variability in our landscapes than there are in lots of other regions in Australia. You know, the land changes over small distances quite a lot, but it, it, it's really important for how this country works. Um, our soils are really low in nutrients, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus, much lower than anywhere else in the world. And, and this is because the soils are so old. So they're really well sorted, they're really weathered. Uh, typically, geologically younger soils than ours are much higher in nutrients, but ours are quite low. However, we have, there is um, parts of our, the way our landscape works, that that's, I'm going to talk about a bit later, where we can capitalise on the nutrients we do have. So the other thing that's really unique to Central Australia and, and catches a lot of people because we don't see it is it looks pretty flat. I mean, I know we see the McDonald Ranges, etc., and we get a bit excited by those, but in, actual, in fact, in between, we think it's really flat, but it's not. Because it's such an old weathered landscape, it's actually really long, really gentle slopes. And what that means is that they mostly drain via sheet flow. It's really poorly organised drainage. So the way our water moves across the landscape um, means that it's mostly sheet flow. And a lot of the stuff which we do which degrades that landscape is where we've disrupted that water flow. So we'll talk about that a bit more too. Um, so the other thing that you know, we all know we don't have very much rainfall in this part of the world, but there's another feature in there that is something really important to keep in mind. So around about this time of the year, like lots of our pastures um, might be a bit low, even just you know, towards the end of um, the winter period, not so much growing. 
And yet this is the period where we often get really high intensity storms. So that leads to, you know, um, an accelerated risk of sheet wash erosion on those really long gentle slopes that I was talking about before. So it goes to again why it's so important to maintain as much um, ground cover as we can because that mulch, anything that's left on the surface reduces that raindrop impact. So there's some of the really basic features that I just wanted to mention because they are a little bit special to hear. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we actually the, our landscape is still productive, sort of in spite of or because of those features. So the first one is that Central Australia is a real mosaic of run-on and run-off areas. And that's at the landscape level. Um, that really helps us make the most of our low rainfall. So if you think about it, when the rain falls, what little is received runs across these really big sheet flow areas into smaller pockets where you're a bit more nutrient rich and you've got a bit more um, moisture accumulates. So, you know, two or three mil across the landscape might result in, I don't know, six, seven, ten mil in a, in a depression. So you can get a bit more growth there. That's also where your nutrients accumulate. Um, so when we look at it at a landscape level, we can think of it from like everywhere from our foothills down to our plains. Really complex uh, landscape with lots of change in it. And you can see in this aerial photo here, it's a little bit tricky there, but even through this space here, there's patches that are greener than others. And it's just that, you know, depressions, slight depressions in our topography catching that sheet wash. Um, so that mosaic of run-on and run-off areas also operates within uh, a land unit level as well. So this type of vegetation in this photo is the um, groved mulga or banded mulga that probably most people are familiar with. So strips of mulga and then more open areas. So again, it's, it's run-on and run-off areas. If you think about some of the landscapes in areas you work in, you can probably think of areas too where it's, you know, you've got um, slight areas that might be a bit more gravelly and they'll run off into depressions that, um, where you can get a bit more growth. So I wanted to add there too, so there's two levels there, that landscape level and then within the land unit. Um, so last week I was um, lucky enough to listen to some scientists through the Rangelands Conference and they spoke about um, biocrusts, so you know the cryptogamic crust etc that we see on the soils. And it was really interesting because it struck me that even at that micro level, we're operating in a run-on and run-off area. So when, it's, um, when those crusts are, are dry, so you might actually get a little bit of runoff that occurs, even just from that crust, just like, you know, centimetres into um, a little gap in the crust. And so you actually are starting to accumulate more moisture even on that really micro level. Um, and then also two cracks in that which become a place for a seed to establish. So you've got this little pocket again, these little pockets always in the landscape. And I think, you know, that comes back to... The other interesting thing about those crusts is that um, people will often think, oh, no, they, there's the, a bit of a confusion between them and, and sealing, and it's, it's not the case because all those crusts actually, as soon as it does start raining, soften. So you know, you've got that immediate effect and then it, it becomes a bit more um, conducive to just maintaining that mulchy surface so you're retaining your moisture in your soil. Um, I like to, I thought that was really interesting because I think it's really important to look at a landscape and think about how it's working, thinking about how the moisture and the nutrients are moving across the landscape and, um, and I've, I've stood in paddocks with people and they've pointed out, and, and you start to get your eye into, ah, that's where the water's moving. And it might not be obvious when you're first standing there, but you can, you know, once you get your eye in and you think about what you're looking for, you can see it. So the other thing with this really poorly organised drainage that's common in Central Australia is that we get really broad, flat drainage floors. 
Uh, I don't think gutters and these little washouts should be as common as they are in lots of parts of central Australia. When you think about it, I'm sure you can all imagine um, some broad mulga drainage areas that are capable of growing really good grasses, etc. So they're collecting a lot of that sheet flow that's coming off other areas. If everything is just moving slowly and it flows into these spaces and it spreads out over a big area, you're retaining that water. When you let that water spreading out, you're retaining it there in that landscape. So they're really productive too because they're making the most of that, that small rainfall we get and there's more nutrients in those regions. So one of the other features that makes um, the arid zone really productive is the fact that our pastures are, are really quite palatable, nutritious and long lasting. And so that's really valuable for us because for most of the time, our pastures are what we call um, water limited. So it's the amount of water that's available that determines how much growth you've got, whereas further north it becomes nutrient limiting. And so they can have as much water as they want. They can't get any more growth because the plants have you know, used up all the nutrients. So, but because ours is typically water limited, it means our plants have this concentration of nutrients. So they're really quite nutritious. And then the other cool thing about that is that our pastures will last for up to two years just standing dry out in the paddock. So it's a product of their inherent nutrition in the beginning and the fact that we live in such a dry climate anyway, it's like a hay shit. So you've got that pasture that's sitting out there. So that really aids in our productivity as well because it's, it's sitting out there and it is available for use into the future. And we know that because we've done um, heaps of samples uh, of dry grasses where they test the nutrition of it and it's the same as, as it was when it was you know, fresh. Um, so what makes the landscape healthy? Well, I think most people are pretty aware that you know, if we can maintain vegetation cover, then that's a really good thing because it's not rain that makes plants grow, but soil moisture. And so we need to keep as much of that as we can. So if we think firstly about the run-on, run-off areas, so we're maximising keeping it into those, you know, that landscape. And then mulch just works to help reduce evaporation. No surprises there. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried to grow a, a shrub in your garden and on a dripper and the grass comes in and because you've got all that water there and then you get that mulchy surface and it just stays really damp under there for, for quite some time. So um, to add to that too, when our, we're talking about these really broad sheet flow areas in central Australia, we want to keep that moving slowly across the landscape. Obviously, if we've got plant cover there, then that's doing that. If we've got mulch, it's doing that. Even these small, you know, little litter banks, you can see, can actually stop a fair bit of surface water from racing across the landscape. So anywhere we pond water, we're increasing infiltration. Yeah. So um, we'll have have a bit of a look at how, what causes these landscape processes to break down. Um, do we have the whiteboard? Do we have the whiteboard? This one here? So I can't do two things at once, but I'll just try and yell. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking about that sheet flow, um, and when we've got these long landscapes. Can most people see that? I could probably put it on a chair. Ah. So this first bit's pretty obvious. So if we've got a, a relatively long gentle slope and then you know maybe a bit of a creek line down the bottom um, and so we've got sheet flow coming across we might have you know, our little short grasses etc in the more open areas and then you've got some depressions where you know, you're accumulating a bit more leaf litter and moisture, so you've got more nutrients, more water, you get a bit more growth there. When that area sort of fills up, because everything's like you know, nice and gentle and very low slopes, you get your water keeps coming, you might have another little depression there. And you've got your shorter grasses, etc., out in the more open areas. 
and that keeps going until you, you, know, you get to your drainage lines, but you've slowed this water flow a lot by retaining that ground cover and thinking about these little micro depressions along the way. And then once it comes into these creek lines, your water flow, a lot of it has infiltrated into your soil. And what's left over it is, so the drainage channel is designed to cope with that much water. Um, and so you'll have, like, we all know that, we've got lots of good vegetation in these drainage areas as well because the water's not flowing too fast. So then what happens is if we, you know, if these areas start to become a bit bare and we've lost some of particularly our perennials, um, then we increase that water flow. So we end up with a bit more hitting the um, edge of the creek. So these edges start to become a bit eroded through here. And we, we've all seen pictures of that. And then the flow down the gutter itself actually becomes more erosive because when you concentrate water flow, it, gets, it becomes more erosive. So then it will it undercuts other grasses um, and you, you're losing your, your, um, your nutrients and your water holding capacity. So you just keep losing a little bit more and your water just keeps running away a bit faster because it's on bare ground. So we've all seen these gutters here. Um, and I suspect that a lot of them could be more, could have, could support more vegetation and be a smoother surface. Um, and most of that comes because we've, you know, probably increased our sheet flow coming across the landscape. So I'm just going to um, go on to that next slide and then I'll go on to that a bit more. Have we got a... Ah, perfect. Oh, Excellent. <laughs> so, so that's the first one, the decline in vegetation cover. So you can see how you get the increased runoff into those gutters and then you've got more water in that channel than it had, so that water becomes more erosive and it keeps moving the soil out. So if we go on to the next one. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so... The other thing that causes these landscape processes to break down is the disruption to the natural drainage patterns. Uh, just give me a moment while I think. It's been a while since I've done this presentation. So um, if we've got a long slope, right, and often they look flat, but there's a slope there. So we've got a lot of surface water moving across it. And then if we end up with a road or something, and it might be like coming across at a bit of an angle, or I might have some windrows or some wheel ruts on there. So quite often what happens is that the water hits here, and we all know that, and it will start to run through the landscape this way. How long does that give me? Two minutes. Right, okay. So, that, um, so we've droughted all this area here, and this, everyone here knows this, I'm quite sure, and we end up with our gullies going back. But what I did want to explain was why gullies keep going back, and it's a thing called base grade lowering. So if we were to look at a landscape, and there's our hill, I'm a terrible drawer, and there's our creek. So that's, that's the slope that that landscape is like stable at. So if we get an incision in this landscape, and it might be a road or a windrow or you know, you've probably seen it on cattle pads, or we've blown out a um, drainage line because we've increased sheep flow into it, so the edge of that drainage line's become unstable. Then as the water comes over here, it starts to erode back. We've all seen that. And it won't stop until it's restabilized. Oh, I'm so bad drawing. Um, at the, until it's restabilized at that original slope. That's why a gully doesn't stop because it's got to get to that stable slope, uh, stable slope again. Um, the other thing that happens too, and the reason that you know gullies start to get these sideways creep is that we've any subsurface flow. So you've got you know rainfall. If you do get some infiltration. And then you start to get a bit of you know, lateral flow through the soil this way. It actually leaks into this gully and effectively droughts this edge bit here. So that becomes a bit more droughted. So you've got less vegetation on the side of the gully and then it keeps exacerbating the problem. So if you look at 
next time you see some washed out areas or some gully, then start to really think about where the water should have been moving and maybe what's causing it to keep going. Um, so anyway, I'm basically finished. So I, I hope that that gave a, a little bit yep, next slide. So if we think about some of those um, main things that drive the productivity for our region, make those landscapes healthy, then we can incorporate that into our strategy. So um, the obvious one being, and I, I listened to you know, the Rangelands Conference the, um, last week, and every single practitioner, every single pastoralist and producer they spoke to, every researcher, every advisor, almost the first thing they said was matching stocking rate to carrying capacity. And that's where we get our grazing management. So that's one of the first things we can do to influence our landscape, um, to keep that ground cover on there. Um, land management too, with our weeds and fires, we all know that like shrub thickening starts to decline that ground cover. You actually get increased runoff because you haven't got the grasses there. Um, maintaining natural drainage patterns. So thinking about that sheet flow when you're putting in fences and roads. Um, and then there's the land rehabilitation techniques, which help to restore some of that run on, run off that we see in this landscape. And I'm sure there's people talking about that in the next day and a half. So, oh, I'm really shook. Okay, so I just quickly mention this story here. So this is at the Old Man Plains Research Station. Um, so you, this is a photo series. It's all in the same place. Um, and you can see the land condition change there that we think has really happened as a result of improving land cover. Um, at the beginning of... So the interesting thing that's happened there is that this is in the catchment of a dam. And since we've improved the land condition in this area, and you can see there's a lot more feed, and it went from you know, relatively bare to originally you know, the early successional species such as button grass, then we got quite a lot of buffle in there. Then the really dry years, um, 2019 and 20, we lost a fair bit of the buffle. Um, but in 2021, we now have a mixture of native grasses, early successional grasses, and buffle grass as well. But the really cool thing that happened with this was that um, the dam doesn't fill there like it used to, because, and it, that's just an indication of how much water we have retained in the landscape and we can grow feed. So I just wanted to throw that one in quickly because um, I think that's a really interesting story. <laughs>